Greetings, programs, and welcome to a new episode of the Awesome Friday Podcast. My name is Matthew, and with me, as is usual, is Simon, and we are back after a, a week off. Uh, so yeah. we're very, very excited to be back. But how are you today, Simon, after your week off? Good. I'm okay. Thanks again to Rachel for covering while I was away. I haven't actually listened to your episode yet, but I'm just going to assume that you're both wonderful because that's just a safe assumption to make, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I she does. Yes, Rachel I, does have the best radio voice, and I think I have a yes. pretty good radio voice. But Rachel has the yeah. best radio voice. She does. Unfortunately, she does. She, she, you do have a lovely, a lovely voice for radio. Um, and um, but Ra- Rachel's got this like NPR. So, <laughs> you know that. So what if I were to tell you, that three years ago, not everything. <laughs> Was what it seemed. Let's go back <laughs> to that. Let's go back to that initial moment. And I, I honestly, Rachel, I, you're probably listening. I could listen to you read a, a shopping list. In fact, <laughs> I, please start your shopping list podcast. You just have a very good voice for it, as we've talked about before. So that's very, very nice. But no, I, um, I went back to the UK for four days. That was nice. <laughs> um, and for some family uh, business, so it was nice to see some family and everything. But I didn't. Um, it's quite a trip going back and then instantly slotting into a different time zone. Because usually when you fly, you give yourself a couple of days. Like, you know, okay, these are my these are my write off days where I'm gonna be my circadian clock is back to front and I'm gonna be a little bit tired and let's plan around that. And this was nope. You're going straight here. You're doing this. I got this. I got three days of. A lot of stuff and then you're flying back again and, and uh, as i said to a few people there that um, having children is a really wonderful way to learn how to cope with absolute sleep deprivation and still be <laughs> mildly functional because you can kind of the trick is not to rest like when you fly there the trick is not to really sleep because once you sleep that's when it gets harder but um it was fine and then when I flew back, it, it weirdly, I took ages to kind of, I think I half adjusted and then I had to half adjust when I came back. And for most of the week after I came back, I woke up like 5.30 in the morning, ready for action. And then I went to bed at 9.30 at night and it made me a morning person, something I've never been before. And let me tell you, I was that's so not, productive. I that's was not so you productive. Being... That's not you being a morning person. That's you being forced into a different time zone. That's 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 <laughs> that, a different thing. I don't know. I've spent my whole life waking up every morning and just cursing the world and rolling into the shower and just I don't really come awake until 11, 11.30 and then I stay up far too late at night. But I actually got a reasonable bedtime. I got a full eight hour sleep and I woke up fresh and ready to do things. Who'd have thought? <laughs> you'd feel better with a more natural sleep cycle. Well, you know, I would have thought because uh, the year I turned 40, I decided I was old and I started making myself go to bed <laughs> at 11 p.m. And then I would just naturally wake up at like 8 a.m. And I was a much happier person as a result. <laughs> and it turns out, now? I mean, uh, that's, that's that's basically it. That's basically it. Um, but yeah, it ter- turns out if you have a regular sleep schedule, you just generally feel better. Um, yeah. which is something I didn't need to know in my 20s and probably should have known in my 30s. <laughs> um, it's interesting because when you're, you know, 19, 20, 28, you know, that kind of thing, um, you can definitely get by with less. Um, but now that we are middle-aged, yes, I definitely case. feel no, God, no. like an adult. It was so, quite nice stopping. We, we had this pretense that when my son went to bed, we'd put something on TV and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> which mm-hmm. is fine for the first 10 minutes and we my, my wife and i would fall asleep on the couch every night and then we wake up at like 11 45 and like, oh god go to bed and you kind of get a tiny little second win so then you're awake till half past midnight and blah 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 so now when my son goes to bed we're like well that's and now we have a tv in the room thanks to you we're like let's just go and watch tv in bed and fall asleep in our beds in front of the tv instead of on the couch and that works pretty well as well <laughs> we're really yeah. we have turned into pensioners within a couple of years haven't we but it's nice yeah, it does feel nice like... about it yeah um i mean so just old watching... I'm just, uh, just just yeah, just I an mean, old man now it's uh 
true. Middle aged. We're middle aged. We are thoroughly middle aged. Yes, we are. Have Which is exactly what the internet. That's what the internet needs. We need. Uh, we need more middle aged, bearded, white, cisgendered, straight men to talk about movies on the internet. And I so that's like the service we have, we're here to provide. I feel like we have the best opinions, though, right? <laughs> of all the opinions, of all the opinions out there, ours are the most measured and reasonable. I mean, I mean, it's not like we're awash in privilege or anything, and have no, no, uh, no, feel no, like no. we have an uh, have an objective place to uh, grade everything from. We can speak yeah. for everyone: Asians, gays, trans people. <laughs> like, really, we we are the voice of your generation. You're welcome. Yeah, we're at the we're at the top of the pyramid, so we can see all the way to the bottom. <laughs> This is awful. This is obviously not how we actually think, but it's funny. Um, yeah, no, I had a normal, pretty normal week, actually. Um, we uh, spent some time with my wife, spent some time with some family, and then um, been watching a lot of movies, caught up on some. I've now seen all, uh, all of the major nominees for the Oscars, except for Bill Nighy in Living. It's the only one I still have to catch up on, I believe. And uh, I ca- cast my vote for I've cast my ballot for the Independent Spirit Awards, which felt pretty cool to do. Um, and I'm pretty excited to watch that awards show, which is I think the day before the Oscars. Um, maybe it's a week before. I can't remember now. I'm excited to watch it. I just don't know when it is. Um, and yeah, and then we watched two two movies this week for the show. And um, they were definitely movies, and we're going to talk about them in a minute. But <laughs> I want to do a quick roundup, if I may, because I, I I had twenty hours of flying in four days, so that means uh, I can give you some much awaited for updates on movies I've seen. Jurassic World Dominion, three stars. Uh, bike race through Malta, extra star for that. Emily the Criminal, fantastic, four stars. Uh, Babylon, I was expecting to hate it. Mm-hmm, Loved mm-hmm. Babylon. We had a, a rather a lovely couple of days bouncing off Babylon together, didn't we? And uh, that Babylon, I'm sure you've we've you've talked about it before. I feel, but anyway, five stars. Uh, the Lobster, Monday, uh, Kafka meets Brecht. Uh, I've never seen any of this guy's other movies, but that's a five star movie. I wonder if his other movies are as good as The Lobster. You can probably yeah yeah about that. most of them are yeah. Uh, this week they're, I saw they're, Pathan. They are all as difficult to watch as The Lobster too, though. Oh, the lobster, the lobster really blew me away, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, it was my birthday on Tuesday, so I took the day off and I went to see Pathan with my wife. And as I said on Twitter, it's for people who thought the Triple X movies were a little too rooted in reality. And didn't, have, <laughs> didn't have, like, the physics were too prevalent and uh, the, didn't have enough musical numbers and didn't randomly turn into um, romantic comedies or heist movies. Uh, or have four layers of flashbacks at one point. Four stars for Pathan. And then uh, I've seen some like, Evan Almighty and Qu- uh, Quantum Mania, which I'll probably talk about a bit more next week. But it's been a lovely I, time of watching the stuff. We should really talk about Quantum Mania, but I have not had a chance to watch it yet. And so that's why we haven't. Um, I can tell you that maybe. in the last two weeks, I've been on a bit of a Godzilla kick. I have watched... 2014 Godzilla, Godzilla King of the Monsters, Godzilla vs. Kong, 1998 Godzilla. And I've actually been furiously searching for... So I'm I'm a big fan of original Godzilla, like early uh, Showa-era Godzilla. I have the Criterion box set, and it's amazing. But I haven't seen a real blind spot in the 80s and 90s. Um, That whole, I think it's called the Hisei area era. Um, When it turned into Power Rangers a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's that's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> basically, the the franchise got rebooted in the early '80s, and before it got rebooted again in the early 2000s, and it's that middle era that I haven't seen a lot of. But it turns out here in North America, or at least in Canada, not a lot of that stuff's available. Um, okay. so instead, we watched Cloverfield the other night, and uh, that's just still a very good monster movie, and maybe I've actually seen it. Maybe the best movie about 9/11, maybe. Oh, Which I think is interesting. that's a whole conversation. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I've yeah. seen Cloverfield Lane, but not Cloverfield. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, we also rewatched uh, one that I think is definitely worth mentioning, uh, which is a simple pl- a simple favor with Blake Lively, or as I like to refer to her now, Blake Deadly, because she's amazing. Um, it's a f- I don't know if you've seen that one, but it's a fun, pulpy, neo-noir mystery, and I loved it. Blake Lively is one of those people, uh, there's a, a group of people that makes me genuinely wonder why there are any straight women. <laughs> like when Blake when Blake Lively exists, when Gal Gadot exists, when Amy Adams exists, like it's I just don't understand. I'm very grateful that there are some straight women, but I, I don't get it at all. Like why yeah. would you why would you not choose to have that? I don't know. Well, um, it's but, um, so you think it's a but, choice. <laughs> so anyway, I was playing uh, Hogwarts Legacy this week, and uh, <laughs> that's uh, no, I wasn't really. I've, I've, I'm not playing that game. Um, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, it's a choice. Sure, every we all have choices. We all choose, don't we? Choose with our hearts. <laughs> that's what love is. We choose with our hearts. If you're yeah. watching all of the Godzillas, you should really include the uh, cartoon that was like late '90s Godzilla and Godzuki. Uh, Godzuki being the scrappy do of Godzilla. I don't know if that. Ever do you mean the? Do you mean the '90s animated show that was based on the '98 movie that was on like Fox Mornings or whatever it was? No. Oh, I don't believe it was based on the movie because I watched it when I was a kid, and I was a kid before the '98 movie. Oh, it's Godzilla, Godzilla, and Godzuki. Godzuki was like a small Godzilla that was basically that cat from The Simpsons that they add in when there's interest wedding. What's that classic Simpsons episode where they add the cat to Itchy and Scratchy? Oh, no, they add Poochie the dog. dog. They add a Poochie. dog, yeah. So, so they, they basically Poochie the dog Godzilla with Godzuki. I, I recommend you look it up because it's it's a horrible, hateful, uh, terrible thing. I mean, you're doing a really great job of selling it. Um, <laughs> the only other thing I wanted to mention now is that I did get a chance, and I don't know if I mentioned it on the last episode, but I did get a chance to rewatch a personal favorite film of mine, which is The Man Who Would Be King, because I also appeared on the Lambcast recently to speak about that movie. And if you like the way I talk about movies, you can tune into that podcast and listen to me talk about one of my favorite movies. But you did the um, podcast without me. Were you okay? Were you feeling okay? Yeah, not on our feed. It was on the Lambcast, which is the po- podcast of the Large Association of Movie Blocks. And uh, I don't every... know that movie at all. That's really? That's a Connery movie. That's it's Connery. Sean Connery, Sean Connery and um, Michael Caine, and directed by John Huston. It's one of the classic adventure movies. Uh, oh. One of my favorite 70s movies based on a Kipling story, so it's slightly problematic at places. Um, Michael Caine just uh, in his same outfit as he wore in Zulu. I mean, they both play they play um, ex British soldiers, ex British colonial soldiers who uh, right. station they are in India and they make their way to Kafiristan to become kings to to like loot the place for gold, basically. And it's whoa, uh, <laughs> that's problematic. And, well, I mean, they end up they they. I mean, it's, you have to watch it, but that's not what happens. Yeah. So. I will watch it. That sounds fantastic. I will find yeah. that somewhere. Yeah, it's and it has a great Christopher Plummer supporting role. He plays. Uh, he basically just he plays Roger Kipling. Sold. Yeah, it's great. Sold. I would watch Christopher Plummer do anything at any point. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. legendary asshole. Amazing actor. Um, oh, Christopher Plummer is an asshole, really. Well, he was. He's dead now. But well, I, um, uh, yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, maybe but yeah, still apparently, is. Who knows? maybe he still is. Who knows? I watched and the Sound of Music very recently, yes. and his uh, his daughter is the the bad guy on Star Trek Picard this season, which is interesting. No uh, way. Yeah, Amanda Plummer. She's a talented uh, Canadian actress, and she is Amanda the villain Plummer on... from St- Amanda Plummer from Stargate. Huh? I oh, know that's not. You're thinking who's of the, Amanda who's, Tapping, who's... I think. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah Amanda's getting mixed up. Well, uh, how is Picard? Give me a one-word review of Picard. Good. Fun. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, I have lots of thoughts. It's a different podcast. Yes, it really is, isn't it? You have no idea, we... man. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay, we're going to get into our two movies now, but we should pencil in... One of the podcasts we always talked about doing, which is me being utterly clueless about Star Trek 
and me just asking you questions and it'll be specifically about Picard. We'll do that. That's yeah, good. we can do some special Star Trek episodes. That'd be good. We we were going to call it Between a Spock and a Picard Place. Yeah, we Isn't were. Isn't that just the best title <laughs> for a Star Trek podcast? I was so, so pleased with that. We actually recorded an episode that we never released, too. Um, oh, we did. You're right. Yeah, Secret so episode. we should we should get back to that. Yes, we should. Be. Okay. Anywho, let's let's, let's talk- transition from banter to movie talk. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> talk around. I don't want to talk about these movies. I don't want to talk about this. Okay, so, what are we so talking this, about this week? So this week we're going to talk about two movies, both 2023 releases, both not the um, freshest in the world. Uh, one from last week and one from the week before. I uh, know. Sorry, one from this week, one from. Because uh, we're talking about different movies than I originally thought we were going to. So one that just debuted on Friday and one from the week before. And we're going to start with the one from the week before, which is the new M. Night Shyamalan movie, Knock at the Cabin, which, uh, spoiler alert, I so as I was watching this movie, I got to a certain point and I was like, Simon is going to hate this movie. Mm-hmm. You know and, uh, and as it turns out, Simon... How did you feel about this movie? Who knew? Uh, and also, this point in the movie was approximately 10, 15 minutes in, we'll say. What was the po- what was was it the point where I texted you and said I'm not fucking watching this? Was no, it was it before it was way before that actually. It was it was the no. point where it, there's a it was the point where I realized just how unsubtle this movie was going to be. Oh my god. Which is pretty much right away. Like pretty much right away. Like it's the end of the first scene, basically. <sighs> Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. I I think I think that it's time that we kind of just accepted the fact that M Night Shyamalan is not a good filmmaker or a writer or or knows how to do anything with subtlety. Now, I I so the only, the only, this. I, wait, wait, the only wait, part wait, of that wait, though, wait, the only part wait, of that wait, though that wait, everyone wait. agrees with is the last part. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. The Sixth Sense is fine. I don't. I think it's massively overrated. I think it's so telegraphed early on what the end's going to be. Uh, I don't get. I don't see the the love for that movie. I actually really like Unbreakable. I think Unbreakable is good, but I like Bruce Willis when he's being his more subtle self. If you call that movie subtle. I enjoyed uh, Split because of James. Uh, help me, James um, McAvoy. Ma- Ma- McAvoy, thank you. Um, but really, I, I watched old. I watched this. I've watched most of his other movies. I, I really, this is just. There's no pleasurable part to watching this film whatsoever. And like <laughs> old, I just think there's no element of interest or or even not thrill thrillers can be noir they can be dark there doesn't have to be a light element in everything but he is just he's so devoid of subtlety or nuance and to, to compound things even worse this is a religious movie and it's fucking just first year university student theology shit that would be drummed out of them within 10 seconds of meeting any kind of teacher it is, just, but it's a whole movie of it, and it's also. I don't care what you say about this film. It's God versus the gays. It's God versus gays, and I'm like, the the book that it's based on. I've looked up. Uh, there's some differences. Now I can't really talk about the differences because it'll be a spoiler. But the book does a better job of finding an ending to this story than the movie does, which changes significantly at the end of this story. And it's just not, it, it skips over massive, massive theological questions. And it, there's, there's no, it's just a deeply uh, uh, unsatisfying, amateurish, blunt, unintelligent, unsubtle uh, hunk of shit. Um, well, so, I mean, yeah. Well, oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Don't sugarcoat it. <laughs> Tell us how I just you really feel. I just like, think, like, I'm glad Shemalian's making movies. A lot of people enjoy his movies, and, and he does love Hitchcock. Unfortunately, he doesn't love any of the te- technical aspects of Hitchcock at all. Like, he, 
each of his movies, like he he goes in with a concept and just murders it, just fucks it because he's not good at what he does. See, I totally, I, dis- I disagree because I think he's actually technically quite good. Um, <sighs> and I think that there's a lot of really, really interesting camera work and framing and such in this movie. I do I mean, 100 it's just- I 100% agree that it is uh, about as subtle as a tractor pulling a boulder. Like it's not, it's not it's a subtle. As well. not a, I didn't find it unpleasant, but like, oh, the, it's just like deeply there's, unpleasant a, to there's a scene, like this is one of those ones where I think those of you with, with, with children and you have to watch, you know, Dave Batista kill fucking, um, Ron Weasley in like the first death scene in the movie in front of a family is it's it it again it's an unsubtle film. I didn't find it to be particularly nasty, just ordinarily nasty, I guess would be the way to put it. Um uh but I think yeah, where I think where he suffers most is as a screenwriter and I think that his dialogue is very basic and very unsubtle and I think that you're right, he definitely skips over uh, a number of questions in this movie. And I'm not even saying that to say that I liked it. I don't, I've been debating whether to give this one a two or a three, basically like a pass or a not pass since I watched it four days ago. Um, and like, I mean, it's not, I just don't think it's worthy of the, like everyone, everyone's opinion is different. I don't think it's worthy of the ire that you hold for it. Um, uh, that's not to invalidate your ire, just that I don't, I don't hold it. I don't, I don't see it. And if nothing else, Jonathan Groff is really good in this movie. And Dave Bautista is super interesting in this movie. And so is Nikki and McBird. And so is the little girl whose name I have blanked on now that I need to know. No, it's Kristen and it's C-U-I. So I'm going to need some advice on how to pronounce an Asian last name. I think it's Kui, 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 maybe? So um, what they're talking about, please feel free to let me know. But she is she is good, sure. And Jonathan Groff, I I think is uh, a wonderful, wonderful performer. He's so good, and he is so wasted in this film. Yeah. And the other guy was I, sorry, I don't know the other guy's name. Uh, his um, name is Ben Aldrich. Uh, I've uh, the cast list is really weird for this. I, they're not even listed on the main cast list. Um, whoever he is, is good. Has he been in stuff? He's probably been in stuff, hasn't he? He's very, very good. Yeah, he's um, been in a bunch of uh, British... T- he's he's um he's British and he's been in a bunch of British TV. He plays um, I, Tom, Thomas Wayne on that Pennyworth show, apparently. Oh, you mean <laughs> Pennyworth colon The Adventures of Batman's Butler? The yeah, that's title. the one. That's the one. Um, is, is he British then? Because he, his accent definitely... He, he had one word that he said really like crisp British accent and the rest yes. is American. Or, right? True, true right. story. His, uh, he also appeared in a show that we both adore called Fleabag and his character name was Asshole Guy. Or sorry, Arsehole Guy. So. No, is that him? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I honestly, there's a couple of moments in this movie where they flash back to uh, the the two dads, my two dads, um, getting <laughs> get, uh, adopting when the um, the the daughter or adopted daughter, and there's scenes of them singing in the car and just do and hanging out and doing stuff. I would have much rather seen an entire movie of my two dads like dealing with their new baby over the years um, than any of the other shit that came with it and honestly I mean, that's, it was, it's, that's it's, never the film he's gonna make though <laughs> no but i just mean i i know i just i mean I, get, I, I don't i i don't like it when movies are nasty just for the sake of being nasty like there was no there was no just justific- justification to anyway it. and it's not like i didn't miss the central premise of the story i know it's meant to be unfair but there were so many fucking holes in this and there were so many things not addressed. And it was so, it was first year. And like the camera angles are fine, but it's first year film student stuff. Like some nice framing and nice pullbacks. There's nothing here that I would say is at all intelligent or nuanced. And it just drove me crazy because you've got these good performers. And um, I thought a lot about um, uh, Cabin in the Woods, which I'm in 
for about half a second. Um, because it's kind of it kind of goes to a similar place, right? Cabin, in other words, a god needing a sacrifice in in order to not kill everyone. And it's a far more interesting movie in how it handles it. It's a different genre for sure, but um, I just I thought this was this film was a failure on every level for me. I hated it. it. Made me feel uncomfortable, and not in a way that not in a way that films do sometimes make you feel uncomfortable, but just because it was so hokey. Uh, I mean, yeah, oh. I, I get my, my, my hot take here isn't actually that hot. It's that the people who, there's lots of range in terms of the people who like it, but the people who don't like it all seem to hate it, which I find really interesting. It's like, there's lots of people who think it's fine or good or great, but there's very few people, very few reviews that are like, eh, it's not very good. Everyone, everyone who doesn't like it is like, this is fucking terrible. <laughs> this is the, mm -hmm. And I find that very interesting. Um, I, I actually for one, enjoyed. Sorry, I like. Driver. I was say I for one. I mean, you're going to give it one star because that's our lowest rating. But mm -hmm. um, I for one, I think I'm going to end up giving it two stars. I think you know, in a in a ten star thing, it would be a perfect five, like right right up the middle, like two and a half out of five. But we don't do that, so it's a two. Because there's enough in the performances there for me to say that, like, yeah, it's definitely there's there's probably something there for someone. And honestly, both of us generally not liking it, um, we're in the minority. Like the the critical consensus is like roughly two thirds like it, one third don't. So I definitely think it's worth checking out for yourself. Um, I will say the order in which the antagonists of the story perish surprised me um but yeah that's uh i had something else i wanted to point out about this movie and i can't remember what it was um and that's mostly because like i didn't, didn't really have that big of an impact on me you know i didn't i didn't see the like gods versus the gays thing it's just they used a gay couple instead of a straight one it didn't bother me um i was totally god first of the gays and dave batista is such a such an interesting if you told me 10 years ago that of the big uh, wrestlers turned actors that Dave Batista would be the most interesting and successful artistically one, um, I'd have been like, really? That guy? But that's the world we live in. He's definitely the most interesting and artistic, artistically successful actor of the wrestlers turned actors, I think. I, I don't disagree with you at all. I do think he needed a, he didn't have the range he needed for this role. I think he's very, very good and what I really like about Batista is that he he took some time off and went to acting classes, just because. And he said he just wants to learn the craft. He wants to be taken seriously as a craft. And uh, you've got to respect that. And I think you can see that in his work as well. And I think he's going to keep getting better. Mm -hmm. um, I thought he was interesting in this. Sure. Um, uh, I'm I'm giving it one star because we're doing it out of five. If we were doing it out of ten, I'd give it one star. Out of 20, I'd give it one star because I can't physically give any less than one star. I actually also, I believe I gave old one star and I found old, at least old had some interesting elements to it that maybe didn't work, but it had some interesting elements to it that surprised me. I would watch old over this in a heartbeat. Um, I really, really disliked it in case that wasn't oh. coming across strongly. Oh yeah, that's, um, that's, that's the thing I was going to say. I think... I think what kind of lets this movie down is that it's for me, it's not the filmmaking or the super basic writing. It's that there's a, there's a lot that sort of the, the movie tries to do a lot of work to cast doubt on whether or not the thing that is supposedly happening is happening or not. But because it's an M night Shyamalan movie, I never at any point thought that it wasn't happening. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he's uh, just not that good at doing that kind of stuff, at building uh, that kind of intrigue. He's not. He's. I mean, not, honestly, he's. Not, he's not, it's not demonstrated in his filmography the capacity to build subtlety and intrigue on any level. It is though, but at this point, he always goes for the twist, so as no longer. I'm no longer like convinced when he like it'd be more. Would have been more surprising. It'd be more surprising to me if he just made a movie that had a straight ending. You know what I mean? And this. Mm -hmm. Does have a uh, just has the ending that of, of course it's an M Night Shyamalan movie, yeah, yeah. And to me, like, um, I haven't seen his first two films, but Six Sense is good, Unbreakable is good, Signs is good, The Village is mostly good, Lady in the Water is atrocious, The Happening is bad, 
The last airbender is atrocious. After Earth is bad. The visit is good. Split is good. Glass is bad. Old is good. This is almost good. Almost good. <laughs> wow, we have a different opinion on his filmography. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I used to be excited to see his movies because at least you knew you were going to get something. And based on most of his filmography, I, I couldn't give a shit anymore. Like, he could keep making... I hope he keeps making movies because some people like them. And maybe he'll make a good one one day. But um, I I <laughs> just don't see any value in this film at all. Yeah. Well, like I say, if you... If you like the performers, I think it's worth checking out. But it's uh, yeah, it's a one star for him, and it's a two star for me, and that's enough about that. <laughs> yes. uh, and that's very much like our next movie in no way, shape, or form. Uh, and let's Simon, why don't you give us the rundown on this week's new Netflix movie? Um, we have a ghost. We have a ghost. Which um, we have a ghost is um, about uh, a family that moves into a new house. And they discover that, um, well, it's in the title. Do they ever say the title at any point? We have a ghost. Yeah, several there, times. There is, they, they have a ghost. And the ghost is David Harbour, um, Ernest the ghost. And he can't speak and he's got amnesia. So he doesn't know who he is. And he tries to scare them away. And basically the first half of this movie is him, first of all, trying to scare them away. And then the family... Uh, uh, seeing him and discovering that they he they could actually use him to make themselves famous and uh, super good the first half is really good um and then uh it turns out there's a shadowy maybe c are they cia i don't CIA, know some shadowy yeah. american covert thing that that think ghosts are actually uh dangerous and so they hunt him and it leads to the truth being revealed about who Ernest the Ghost is. And let me tell you, this is two movies smushed together and uh, is not better for it. It's um, a really interesting and apt way to put it, I think. The first half and the second half seem fairly divorced from one another thematically. And I think, honestly, you could tell... So there is this the whole subplot with like the shadowy CIA group I think you could get to all of the same places if they just weren't in the movie. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like they, yeah, totally. they, they exist to be an antagonist in the story and they do not need to be like at all. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, yeah. And even like the, the setup to the point before we even know the CIA is involved, like the setup is all there. And then they're like, Oh, let's just throw the CIA in too. Let's you know that way we can have a big car chase in the third act. And, um, yes. and it just doesn't like, it doesn't make like, I, I, I think I don't, this movie is. There's going to be those of you that enjoy it. I think David Harbour is really good, and I think that um, Anthony Mackie is really good, and the new kid uh, whose name I can't pronounce. I think it's Jahi Jahi Winston um, plays the sort of son who can a family son who connects with Ernest the Ghost. I think he's quite good, um, but the story is kind of crap. It's kind of crap. It's uh, that's the. Yeah, I mean, the most frustrating thing about this is that you're 100% right. The, in the first half of this movie, you've got a really solid setup. I love the beginning as well. The beginning is really just a fun way to start. Anthony Mackie uh, is just so... Uh, he's a very charming performer. and He's just so comfortable as house dad. And mm-hmm. uh, all the you've got the, the husband and the wife, and it's, it's really... I think it's quite well written. The kids are very different and they've got very believable um, personality differences that there's clearly lots of conflicts in there. And and the first half when they discover the ghost and are not really scared by it and and start learning how they can exploit him to get famous. We've seen this movie before, right? In Mm -hmm. fact, there's one point, it does feel really Beetlejuicey when David Harbour tries to scare off like a TV interviewer, his face melts and he makes like terrible CG faces and walks terrible CG uh, on all four legs. It's very Beetlejuicey. And in fact, at one point, Anthony Mackie does shout Beetlejuice three times at him. And you're like, it really does feel like that. I'm really Mm -hmm. glad this movie is embracing that because it feels like that. And you think, okay, so this movie is going to be 
learning not to exploit people because Ghost has feelings and finding out who he is and uh, mending the, the friction between the family as they learn that the, uh, the popularity and all the people camped outside and all the news reporters don't make them more fulfilled. They make things emptier and really they were a family after all. And you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm down. And honestly, Actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting, well, there's one interesting angle in there in that casting an African-American family to learn not to exploit the ghost is super interesting. Yes, yes it which is. They, which they honestly and, just do not do. Like no, even no, I know. And I, it's funny because you'd seen this a few days ahead of me and I asked you how it was and you're like, oh, it's fine. And I got to a point in this just before halfway well, I was like, oh, this is going to be an interesting podcast because I, I'm i really enjoying this film. This is exactly my kind of film that I want to show to my kids as well. It's really fast, and upbeat and funny and and we're going to argue over this one. And then the second half happens. The second half happens uh, and you, you've got a, a rogue doctor played by Tick Tig Notaro, who I don't think is a an interesting performer at all, and uh, you, they, it, it feels like it would have been better actually as two movies. I think the first movie about learning not to exploit Ernest, and then the second movie where the the shadowy cabal come out and chase him around town, and that would have worked a little bit better because it is exactly like this thing has been chopped in half, and the second half the pace plummets. That you've got like CIA groups that didn't exist ten minutes ago now have all these energy weapons uh, to to trap the ghost. Who they and then within like five seconds, this rogue doctor who goes from the ghost of dangerous to crying at him and then freeing him, and it's just meaningless. It's completely meaningless. And then it drives to this grand revelation about who he is and someone. Turns out he was murdered by this that this person, and he meets this person, at the end. and it's just uh, the second half is awful. Actually, I really, really disliked it because it loses all of that family charm from the beginning. It loses all of that. There's a very funny moment where there's loads and loads of people outside the house and trying to get in, and the the wife is trying to tell the husband to he's got to stop all this, and he's like, it's fine, and Anthony Mackie's so good, it's like, it's fine, it's fine, I'll take care of it. And a guy dressed as Jesus appears at the window, and there's a cut to the window, and the woman goes, Jesus Christ! And that just really amused me. Like, that was really funny, and that's very soon before the movie just takes a nosedive. And I love... Isabella Russo is this young Asian girl called Joy who makes friends with Kevin, the the younger son of uh, Anthony Mackie's family. And I love how sparky they are together. And she, she's a really funny kid as well. And it just loses all of this in the second half, nonsensically. I don't know. Am I, uh, how, how, what's your take on this? Yeah, it loses all of that charm basically to become a low-budget superhero movie in the in the back half like to become like a bad marvel movie and it's very frustrating because like i don't want to spoil the movie but like in the beginning in the beginning when we first meet tig notaro she's like a failed ghostologist or some shit and there's a very obvious way like i so i will say that in the first half i was very worried that i was going to know exactly where everything was going to go because of the setup is pretty stereotypical pretty pretty typical of this kind of movie and then it did like you know not go there but it went to a totally terrible place and uh, the rev there's a revelation that you mentioned where you know this the, this one doctor like turns on a dime from being like we have to catch the ghost to i have to let the ghost go and like yeah. There's a there's a there's a reason that that would work baked into the plot that is not oh. in the not in the movie. Right, I know. Right. I was waiting for that to happen, and I yeah. couldn't believe it when it turned out not to be the thing. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And I get and like I get it that if it had been the thing, we might be saying that like this is fine and a little predictable. But I would take mm -hmm. predictable this over what makes sense. I would I would yeah. take predictable and makes sense over. Mm -hmm. what we got anyway totally 100 percent. yeah 
And I will say that, like, you know, if you like David, like, David Harbour's amazing. And he does so much with no dialogue in this movie. And mm-hmm. he and the director, Christopher Landon, who has made a, a number of movies that we both adore. Yeah. Namely, yeah. Happy Death Day 1 and 2 and Freaky. Um, which is a hell of a three-movie run, if you ask me. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, he seems to really get the sort of the physics of the way that the ghost works and him and Harbor really seem to have worked out like how they, the ghost should interact with the real people. And, um, and yeah, and like, it's frustrating because there's so many pieces of this movie that are good, but ultimately it fails because the back half decides to be a, a bad superhero movie yeah. or a bad. It's not even a superhero movie. It's more like, you know, that movie you've seen where there's an alien being and the government is after him yeah. and then he has to escape at the end. Yeah. It's that movie. It's just E. It's E.T. or Starman. It's just not, or... not done well at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's even it's even the like subplot in the last Starfighter where there's a robot. Anyway, <laughs> um, so so yeah. I mean, for me, it's a two star movie. How about for you? Yeah, it's two for me as well because I really loved the first half, and there's you can almost see the line when it stops. Yeah. Like there, are, I'd recommend you watch the first half of this movie. It's also far too long. It's over two hours long, and it does not need to be that long. Yeah, it's um, like two hours and seven or two hours and yeah, ten, it, it, it is like good. That. It's a good twenty minutes too long, and um, uh, yeah, watch watch the first half of this movie and imagine the Beetlejuice style family fun thing it could have been, and then when. The when Tignataro turns up and all the CIA people start storming the house, just turn it off because you've seen the rest of this movie done a million of times better in other movies, and it's just not very good. And it, and it blows all of the goodwill from the first half, and all of the good characters, and all the resolutions are really forced and really contrived and really fake, and just doesn't really make sense. So, yeah, I just turn it off, which is unfortunate. Imagine, imagine how you would finish it because, based on the first half, your ending, your imagined ending to that movie is going to be better than what they actually give you. Yeah, that's probably true. But it is on Netflix, so if you're a Netflix subscriber, you can watch it for well, not free, but <laughs> yes. you know, for no extra charge. As long as you live in the same house. I would say that, like, if you have like a ten or twelve year old, as you do, it might be worth just like throwing it on in front of them if you need them out of your way for a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, it's not would, a good no, movie. No, I would No, I was thinking that for the first half until I would I wouldn't put this on in front of them the second it's, half. Maybe it's funny because it's, yeah, it's funny though because we have a whole generation of people who are in their like 20s and 30s who now think that the Star Wars prequels are good because they grew up watching them as children. So this could be that for the next generation well, of children. Because the, the, so. the Star Wars movies are just as bad, if not worse, than this. So, and lots of people think they're great. So, I don't get it. <laughs> That's <but> a reach. <laughs> I don't think I, it is. Think people like like all I, kinds of bad movies. But you like the, the you problem. like Pacific Rim too. Like, how can we? Oh, how can we? How can I love we? Pacific Rim too. How can we? Yeah, how can the, we judge people based on their on their taste? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, my favorite Resident Evil is six. Take that, take that how you will. Um, I love Pacific Rim two because it's Wait. just you know, it's, which one is six? Uh, it's the one that literally everybody hates. It's the one that was basically turned into a Roland Emmerich action movie um, with lots of uh, flashy Michael Bay style um, quick time events and um, quick quick shooting zombies in the face. And you are uh, describing most of those movies. <laughs> oh no, the the game. I don't know which the, the movie is. I oh, you're talking about the movies. game. Okay. Yeah. I, was like, I thought you were talking know. about the movies because there have been seven uh, movies. Yes. No, I keep meaning to watch the Wild West one because it looks intriguing, but it's probably terrible. Um, no, the, the, the Resident Evil movie that's set in the post apocalyptic Vegas desert is my favorite of the, mm. of the franchise. Oh, I think, it's, I think I've got it. It's called Apocalypse or something, isn't it? I think so, yeah. I'm sure I've got it over here. I'm just looking at my yeah. vast physical DVD collection. But no, I um, sure people. Uh, 
horses and courses and all that. But I think the main problem with this film that my kids would find, I'm sure, is that the first half is really upbeat and fun. And the second half is a slow drag that turns into something completely different. I think they would disengage completely. Hmm. Because they they love Beetlejuice. They love Beetlejuice. And so uh, it, for this film, ain't that. The second half of this film really lets down the first. Hmm. Extinction. Extinction is the Resident Evil movie, I think, is best. It's the third one. It's also... Oh, yeah, I have a... I have one called Apocalypse, Resident Evil Apocalypse. Is that a good one? I don't no, know. that's the second one. Although I will say that the uh, second and third one both have the advantage of not being directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, who, uh, well, that's a whole other podcast. I don't think he's terrible. I just think oh. he, he has like a very particular set of skills that he applies very narrowly. <laughs> Oh man, I have opinions on Paul W. That is a whole different podcast. You, we might have, you sir, I think we might have opinions <laughs> about not the director. Not many, not many directors make me physically angry. But let me tell you, <laughs> I have had to, I've had to make a choice to stop watching his movies because I feel my blood pressure, my blood pressure can't take it. I feel like hedonism bot over here, Simon, with opinions <laughs> about a director, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever next. Yes. Anyway, just think it. well, that's very much like uh, we have a ghost. Uh, what and you, um, what are you giving it? Two stars, right? Two, yeah, two stars, yeah, two. two shiny stars. Two for the first half, zero for the second. Yeah. And, yeah. Good. Yeah, it's inter- so, it's um, interesting how, how well used David Harbour is and how wasted Tignataro is in this movie, I will say. If you're if you're yeah. a fan of her shtick, which I generally I, see, am. I've, I've seen her in two things, and in both things, I've thought her part could be played a lot better by many other people. Uh, is, she that definitely... your cat? is that yeah. your cat disagreeing with me? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, that's those okay. two movies. Let's cut it there because we both yeah. have lives to get back to today, and <laughs> uh, for better or for worse. And um, so, uh, Knock at the Cabin is still in theaters and now on demand. And uh, We Have a Ghost is on Netflix. And uh, I'm always on team watching for yourself, but neither one is very good. Um, thank you to everyone who's listening for listening, whether you're new here or old here, we're happy you're here. Uh, if you've liked what you heard, please consider liking, subscribing, um, giving us a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice or supporting us a little more directly with, uh, uh, Patreon or Kofi, which will both be in the show notes. Um, you can find me on Twitter while Twitter still exists at SmathUAF, and you can find Simon on Twitter at Temporary Pen, and you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Awesome Friday CA. Um, we record this here in Vancouver on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Uh, one more time, thank you so much for listening and for joining us on this Awesome Friday. Thanks, everyone. Bye.